All right. Good afternoon to those in the East Coast and um, anyone in the European time zone. And good morning to anyone in the Pacific time zone and any other time zones. Welcome. Um, today we have an exciting presentation. We have uh, Dr. Tom Kurtzman, who's presenting on water structure and therm thermodynamics and drug discovery. This is episode 10 of um, Cyclica's Molecule to Medicine series. We also have um, uh, our host, Ali Madani, who is Director of Machine Learning at Cyclica. So he'll be kind of moderating the discussion um, in between Tom's presentation. And so I'll get to them in one minute here. Just, just before we introduce our speakers, I just wanted to share exactly, for those of you new, um, Cyclica has a um, presentation called Molecule to Medicine, whereby every month we have a different type of topic. Um, we either host lecture episodes or fireside chat. So this month is, is a lecture episode. So you're tuning into more of an academic style lecture. Next month, we will have more of a fireside thought leadership, casual discussion. And those topics range on, on a variety um, of discussion topics. So you can see the, the, the variation of, of topics within our episodes, um, and you can always refer to our website for more information. So it's cyclicarx.com, and you can find the link on uh, Molecule to Medicine within our website. And so um, I'm just going to give a brief um, overview of Ali. So Dr. Mali, uh, Ali Madani is the Director of Machine Learning at Cyclica. Um, in his role, he guides scientists and engineers to further improve Cyclica's deep learning and machine learning technologies for drug discovery. He obtained a PhD at University of Toronto, focusing on application of machine learning in cancer medicine and biomarker discovery after finishing his two masters in mathematics and engineering at University of Waterloo. He's also worked on a series of scientific articles in high impact scientific journals, so I invite you to, you can go to the Cyclica website and view his, his full bio um, or on LinkedIn. And without further ado, we have Tom Kurtzman, who's a pro professor at Lehman College at, through the City University of New York. His research focuses on the development of computational methods that aid in the discovery and rational design of new drugs. Dr. Kurtzman earned his BA in chemistry from the University of California, Santa Cruz and a PhD in chemistry from Stanford University. And he pursued postdoctoral research at Columbia University and hence why he's based in New York now. So we're looking forward to what Tom has to say. And um, without further ado, I will pass it over um, to the two of you. So thanks very much. Thanks, Jennifer. You want me to share now? Yeah, that looks great, Tom. Thank you. You see that full screen? And you can see my cursor. Yes, you have this screen. You see my Windows blue circle? Um, yeah, I, it's in the first okay. All right, thanks for, the, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. <clears throat> um, just sort of a caveat here is I'm really trained as a statistical mechanic and a liquid state theorist. And at some point when I was finishing my PhD, I wanted to do something that had some relevance. And somebody told me water was relevant in biological systems. And so going on that, I pursued a, a postdoc in, in Bruce Burns group at Columbia University and started looking at water on the surfaces of proteins. And have really, this was about 15 years ago now, and it really sort of focused my entire research, the entirety of my research efforts into understanding how water structures itself on the surfaces of proteins and, and how we can use the information of, of water structure and thermodynamics on the surfaces of proteins to aid in the discovery and optimization of new pharmaceutical compounds. Um, so I really sort of started every talk that I've given over the past 15 years with the picture of this streptavidin biotin system, because it really highlights uh, water structure and, and how it can be used um, in drug discovery. 
And so this is this is on the right. We have biotin and, and streptavidin, and biotin is is a ligand with very high ligand efficacy, binds very tightly for its size, and it it's interacting with the protein surface. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, donating hydrogen bonds and accepting hydrogen bonds, and those are shown with yellow dots right here. And the gray is the cavity that it binds to. And if we were to remove this ligand and, and, and run simulations of what water is doing in this cavity, one of the things we see is that the, is that the water in the cavity does makes very similar interactions to the protein surface that, that the ligand does. The water donates a hydrogen bond here, it accepts a couple here, donates here, it accepts a couple here, and over here it neither donates or accepts. And, and, and early on in, in my career, I worked with Novartis quite a bit, and they used to joke, this is the, the hydrophobic water. And, but the interactions that the water make, it makes with the protein surface are very similar. And so we can ask the question, can we sort of use how the water is interacting with the protein surface to help us identify and find new, new compounds? Um, so uh, uh, a little background right here is, is so um, when you're a physical chemist, you, you look at a problem of, of molecular recognition as solution and you basically say, well, okay, I have two moieties and they could be any moieties. And, I want, we want to know what's the free energy of this process. Why would this process happen spontaneously in your body or in, in a cell or in, in a liquid solution? So if this red is my ligand and this, in this blue over here is my protein, I want to really sort of find out why would this happen? Why would this molecule come and interact with this molecule and the preponderance of the molecules in the solution would be on the right-hand side? meaning there'd be a protein ligand complex. And for me, what was really important here is what's the contribution of water? And what happens is this is when you look at any two molecules coming in together in solution and the solution is water, the water can often have a dominant contribution to whether or not this happens or not. And in drug discovery, often what uh, medicinal chemists do or what drug discoverers do is they really focus on the interactions between the protein and the ligand. And those are indeed important, but the water often has a more important contribution. And I, I like to give an example from general chemistry when talking about this is that if you take sodium cations and chloride anions, uh, the sodium cations positively charged, the, the chloride anions negatively charged, their direct, direct interactions are very, very strong. You put them in solution and what do they do? They come apart, they, they, they separate. So you have very strong direct interactions, but two molecules, but the two atoms come apart. You go ahead and you have fatty molecules like, like in olive oil and you put them in solution and what happens? Well, first of all, they interact by much weaker van der Waals interactions. You put them uh, together in solution, they have weak direct interactions and what happens in water is they come together. And so why is that? So you have strong direct interactions, the molecules come apart, you have weak direct interactions, the molecules uh, come together. Uh, and that's because really what drives the thermodynamics of this process is the solvation. And it turns out that the solvation of hydrophobic molecules like olive oil, like in olive oil are, is more favorable when all the molecules are together and the hydration of sodium and chloride ions is more favorable when they're apart. And so it's really the water that's dominating the, the free energy of this process or the affinity that the molecules have together with, for each other in solution. And um, the same can be true, or, or at least it's partially true that the, the contribution of water to this process is is as important as the direct interactions when you think of a, of a ligand or a small molecule drug with the protein surface. And really the reason for this is that, is that the water molecules, the way that they hydrate the two things separately and the, uh, has a contribution to the free energy, it has a solvation free energy and how they, how they do them, how they solvate the complex together has a free energy. And if you look at that change in free energy of the solvation, that's the contribution. <clears throat> All right. 
So I'm going to give a little background on water structure, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but it's basically uh, the approach that I that I tend to use is so um, so how does water structure itself on a surface, whether it be a protein or a ligand? And so it's really dominated by two physical features or two physical contributions. One is packing. So the water molecules will pack around. This is the uh, hydration of a methane molecule. The water molecules will pack around the methane molecule to form a cage around here. And so uh, they'll fill up any space and they'll do so in a manner such that they maintain their hydrogen bonding. So water structure is really dominated by packing into the region. You go ahead, you put balls in a, in a cup, they sort of pack into that cup. So water molecules will pack into any surf, around any surface. And then they'll, then they'll do that in such a way that they hydrogen bond with their neighbors. So this water molecule right here donates a hydrogen bond here, it donates a hydrogen bond here, it accepts a hydrogen bond from behind it, and where we're standing, where the viewer is standing, there's presumably a fourth hydrogen bond. And so this is the typical picture of hydrophobic hydration, is that the water molecules will pack around the hydrophobic solute, and, and they'll do so in a way that they're able to maintain all of their hydrogen bonds. So there's effectively, the received wisdom is there's no energetic penalty for hydrating a hydrophobic surface, but there's an entropic penalty. And that entropic penalty comes from the ordering that's necessary to form this cage. And if you look at this, so one, there's translational ordering, meaning these water molecules have to form these rings or this clathrate cage, which has a clear order. And so that would be translational ordering. But then there's also orientational ordering of the water molecules where each water molecule that forms the vertices of this cage has to orient it in, su orient in such a way that it's making hydrogen bonds with its neighbors. This water molecule is oriented such that it donates a hydrogen bond here, donates one here, and accept, accepts one from over here. And so this is an entropic penalty. That ordering is an entropic penalty. So we can basically describe water on the surface as, or we can ask two questions. How well does the water maintain its energetic interactions with its environment? And what's the ordering necessary to do this? One gives us the energy, the other gives us the, the entropy, and together they give us the free energy uh, of, <clears throat> of solvation, of solvating the surface. This is for uh, the. This is a simple picture of the hydration of a clathrate uh, of the of methane. But we can really ask the same question on any surface: a green surface and an orange surface. This could be a ligand and a protein. It could be two proteins. It could be any two molecules. We can ask how well do the water molecules maintain their energetics on the surface, and and what's the ordering necessary? And when these two surfaces come together, so the the Water molecules on the surface will have a different energetic interactions with their environment. They'll have different entropies from the ordering. And when the two surfaces come together, they'll be expelled out into the bulk water over here. These water molecules solvating these two surfaces independently will no longer be solvated and, and will have a contribution to the free energy due to the differences in the of the energy of the water molecules on the surface and out in the bulk and the differences in the entropy of the water molecules on the surface out in the bulk and so that's uh the contribution to free energy of aggregation or molecular recognition and solution or at least the solvation contribution All right water structure in a binding site is very similar to water to what the physical uh contributors to uh to water structure on protein surfaces is very similar. It's dominated by packing and hydrogen bonding, but now we have the restrictions that we have to pack into this narrow region, and we wanna do so such that the water molecules not only make good interactions with their water neighbors, but also make hydro hydrogen bond interactions with the protein surfaces. And what happens on some surfaces is that we can't really do this ideally, is that you can't, it, it, or that is that, the water molecules may not be able to maintain a full complement of hydrogen bonds with their environment when they're on the surface of the protein. Okay, so given this, one of the things I wanted to do early on was go ahead and sort of figure out, well, I can look at water molecules on a surface. A water molecule here has a very different environment than the water molecule over here. It's energetically interacting differently. 
and the amount of ordering that it has is different. This water molecule here is this is a simulation of water in the, in, in the streptavidin pocket. This water molecule here is quite ordered, and it forms these two hydrogen bonds. So I could go ahead and basically look at this water molecule, run a simulation, calculate the energy of interaction that it has with it, its environment as a whole, and assign that energy to it, and then go ahead and look at how ordered these were. And I wanted to quantify this ordering that we're seeing in this five-membered ring. And the important thing is, is that the water molecules that are on this region right here have very different energetic in interactions with their environment and very different ordering that's necessary. So their energies and entropies are different. So effectively displacing the water from this region out into bulk where they have the same properties would be different than kicking this water molecule out from the surface. Right? So we'd like to go ahead and quantify the energies and entropy and map them out spatially. Right, so very early on, all we did is we went ahead and we took a, a green dot for the oxygens at every single frame of the simulation and you get this distribution and drew spheres around each one of these and basically took the average of the energies of every frame and assigned an energy here, looked at the distribution of the orientations and positions and were able to calculate an entropy using something called inhomogeneous fluid solvation theory. And th this can get a little more complex, but effectively this is the Shannon entropy. This is the integral of the probability of a water molecule being at, at a given place R with a given orientation omega times the log of the probability of that water molecule being at a given place times an orientation. That's what a Shannon entropy is. It's the integral of P log P. And you can go ahead and calculate the entropy of the ordering that we see in this movie right here, which is the translational ordering that that we see in this five-membered ring and the orientational ordering as well. Okay, so, and this ended up being something that that was licensed by Schrodinger and 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 became uh, a, uh, a software that was sold to the pharmaceutical industry called WaterMap. And so um, there were some deficiencies in WaterMap. And one of the things was, is that when we went ahead and we looked at the distributions, we would draw these spheres around different clusters of water molecules, but there were water molecules that, that fell outside the spheres. You can see the green dots outside of these spheres. So these are hydration sites and that's what WaterMap did. It, it identified the entropies and energies or approximated the energies and entropies of water inside each one of these spheres. And so on the left here, we, we can see all the water molecules that are effectively displaced when biotin binds to this pocket. Here are the spheres that we draw so it the water map would only include a treatment of the water molecules that were in in these spheres and then all these green particles here would be effectively ignored by by that treatment and really what what i wanted to do is i wanted to have something and i'll go i'll go back a few slides that accounted for the solvation thermodynamics both of the initial state and of the final state and to really do that we needed something that treated the thermodynamics of all the water molecules in the system. So Mike Gilson and I got together. We met at, 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 a, at a conference actually in, in Vancouver and, and said, look, we need to go ahead and have a space filling treatment of water thermodynamics and mapping water thermodynamics in the surface. So we came up with something called a grid in homogeneous solvation theory. And effectively what that did is it, it divided space up into three-dimensional voxels and calculated these same quantities on the surface of a protein. And what that allowed us to do was, base, was fully account for the thermodynamics of solvation of the two molecules, a ligand and a protein separately and a ligand and a protein together. And we could get the change in free energy of the process and the and es good estimates of the of the solvation contribution to uh, to the molecular recognition between two moieties, right? So uh, this ended up there ended up being lots of different you know sort of commercial packages and 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 now academic packages that map out solvation on the surfaces of proteins. Here's a couple pictures. So if you have a binding site, you could basically go ahead calculate run your simulations of water and map out regions where the water is unfavorable here in red, where they're moderately unfavorable over here and favorable, which would be in green. And this is a, a picture I just 
ripped off the web for water map. It's a nice picture. It shows the cavity that you can bind to and the solvation on the surfaces. And the idea is, is if we have this ligand and we know it binds, we could go ahead and modify this ligand such that it goes and displaces water from an unfavorable region. And that would have a, a favorable contribution to the change in solvation free energy and therefore a, a favorable contribution to the binding affinity of the ligand for the protein target. This is 3D RISM, also a nice picture. Red would be regions of unfavorable solvation. It's a continuous treatment as opposed to the hydration sites that you see in water map. And green would be sort of favorable regions of hydration. And you could also directly lead design by trying to displace water that was unfavorable there. But one of the problems I noticed very early on was that if we use this idea, hey, we want to displace water from unfavorable regions, well, I just mapped out how much water is unfavorable compared to bulk. This is minus 6.3 kcals. This is effectively the, the free energy of bulk water. And looked at all the regions that were displaced by ligands that bind to factor 10A. And we find out, well, a lot of them are unfavorable, but a lot are, are favorable. And so we really couldn't make predictions about what waters would be displaced based on the thermodynamics alone. So, sorry, Tom. What, yeah. So I have a question, great presentation. So I'm wondering, so the water, the contribution of water packaging or organization of water within the binding sites is somehow dictated by the molecule and protein, protein binding site itself, right? So That's right. we're... So I'm wondering if we think about application of machine learning in this area, right? So it tries to identify patterns, not necessarily considering all physical knowledge directly. So I'm wondering what do you think about indirect identification of those knowledge by machine yeah. learning without necessarily including the water molecules? Okay, so one of the things that we wanted to do very early on was go ahead and say, well, look, if I could I identify structural motifs of the protein, right here, I have an acceptor, I have a donor right here, and I have, I have topographical features of the surface, which is the curvature of the surface right here. Can I go ahead and identify these topographical features of the surface and then know what the properties or the thermodynamic properties of this water are. I, that's never come to fruition. I mean, this is something that, that I've been thinking about 15 years ago. And, and one of the problems, and this is what I would view as a problem for using machine learning here, is you know, machine learning is only as good as what it's trained on. And the, uh, the variety of topographies that you're getting on a protein surface, and particularly in binding sites, really changes from one system to another. And so there, you, you never really have environments that can be subcategorized and can be learned in a way that I think you know, machine learning would, would do. I mean, in the end, you basically have to go ahead and see if it trains it. But I'll give you a couple reasons why I would be skeptical that machine learning could get water structure and thermodynamics right on the surface. And, and that is, we're really interested in binding. So you, you need a, a plethora of data to train to. So you could run simulations and I've actually done this. I'll show you, maybe show you something later, but you run a plethora of sim, simulations so that you can really sort of sample all the different possible environments and then learn based on those environments. But binding cavities are rare on protein surfaces. They're enclosed, they're these pockets. So you don't have as much sampling there. And then, and then they also change shape and, and, um, and they vary significantly from one system to the other. So it's a question of, do we even have enough protein structures and enough environments that we could readily sample and get these types of things, right? There's another thing that happens here, which is packing is incredibly important. And so, so if you go ahead and look at, okay, what's the properties of the water molecules on this particular surface, it really matters if we're in an enclosed region. So you have to look at how the water packs in or if we're in an open region. And so the solvation of these two moieties on a flat surface is gonna be very different in a streptavidin cavity where you have local enclosure. So I, I would, I know that people are working on it. I would be, I would, uh, 
question whether or not I've had one foray into machine learning and found out, hey, we just don't have enough data to fit this kind of stuff. And and right. I, you're well aware of that. And I would be very skeptical that we could actually get these types of things. I think physical model is what gives us the answer here. Right. Thanks. All right. So so beyond the thermodynamics, I wanted to look at things like like structure. All right. And so we have a so so and whether or not looking at local water structure is something that we could could be predictive of should I bind to this pocket or not. And so here we sort of have ideal hydration. And by ideal hydration, the water molecules make all the hydrogen bonds with the protein surface and with each other. Uh, over here would be suboptimal hydration. The water molecules are making all the hydrogen bonds with other water molecules, but not making the proper hydrogen bonds with the surface. Over here, the water molecules are making all the hydrogen bonds with the protein surface, but not with each other. And the ligand comes in and would displace these. But you can see that if we were to kick water out that was predominantly characterized like this, and that we should get more of a contribution like than we would over here, because these water molecules out in bulk could form a full complement of hydrogen bonds. The same thing here. If the ligand came in and made this and displaced water over here, the ligand would make hydrogen bonds with the protein surface that the water isn't. One of the problems in developing a method that characterizes this is that all three of these are actually happen because the water is fluid and moving around. So really what we want to do is characterize which one of these is sort of predominant and how do we even define predominant? And uh, I have some methods that go ahead and do that, which I'm not going to get into. Um, but the general idea is that if the ligand comes in and displaces water that looks like this, it's making more hydrogen bonds with the surface. And in general, when you come in and the ligand makes a hydrogen bond with the surface, has to break a water hydrogen bond with the surface. So effectively, you don't get any contribution from that. If we can identify regions where the water's not making that, we can, we can, this compensation is no longer true. I should put a red X through this, and we could get something where the ligand protein interactions are better than the water protein interactions, and we have a favorable contribution to the binding. Same thing here is that when this ligand comes in, this water is going to be displaced. We don't get anything from the hydrogen bonds. The water is making the same hydrogen bonds with number of hydrogen bonds with the surface, but the water structure is going to be more favorable when it gets kicked out because the water molecules can interact with other with other water molecules in, in bulk biological form. So that we have some, I have some tools that go ahead and characterize and map out these structural and energetic properties on the surfaces of proteins and do it on a grid and also in, in, in the hydration site approach. <clears throat> so those are effectively the physical principles that, that uh, govern, I don't have a clock here, that govern the um, binding to, to, to the salvation contribution to binding. How do we actually go ahead and use this? Okay, so um, early on in the SARS-CoV-2, we all got together and we said, okay, we're going to go ahead and, and look at the salvation of, of the main protease and other proteins uh, and on the, uh, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 that are therapeutic targets. This is, this is actually the target that Paxlovid hits. And what we did is we mapped out the salvation using hydration sites and using grid-based methods on the surface and really and identified you know, hydration sites that are proximal to the ligand so that we could go ahead and do some, maybe some lead drug discovery or, or use that. Um, so what we, what we sort of focused on was this water molecule right here. And I wanted to just go ahead and say, well, why would we focus on that site? Okay, so we, we have measures of structure. So this water, first of all, this water in this site, it's in this hydrophobic cavity. It's highly enclosed, which is one of our metrics of structures. How enclosed is it by protein surface. It's highly energetically favorable. It's unfavorable. Uh, 2.6 kcals compared to bulk water. It's entropically unfavorable because look how ordered it is when it's here. Overall, about four and a, four and a half kcals. It's structurally frustrated. If we look at how it interacts with its environment, it's only forming 2.8 hydrogen bonds on average compared to about 3.6 in bulk. And the other one is it's mechanically displaceable. We can come in from above on this cavity and we can put a hydroxy group here and make the two interactions that this water makes with the protein surface. 
So one of the questions you have to ask is if I come in with a ligand, can I replace the interactions that the water does? In certain circumstances, the water might make better interactions with the protein surface than you can with any chemical moiety that you could make. And so the geometry has to be right such that we can come in with a group and make those two interactions. Uh, this is, so one of the nice things is you come up with a methodology of doing things. One of the difficult things is that you don't really get to know whether or not that methodology works for eight to 10 years, because you, that, that's the, that's the time scale of drug discovery is, is eight to 10 years. And this work is all early stage drug discovery. So one of the first drugs that was, that was discovered with the aid of using salt was, was rogeratinib identify some unfavorable waters work, go ahead, design your ligand or optimize your ligand to displace those. So this has actually been used. Now, an early idea in, in, in solvation mapping was we have to go ahead and we only look at the initial state and we identify unfavorable regions. We want to displace the water there. And that's sort of being, being thrown out but part of it is kept because we want to identify unfavorable water, but we also have to consider how the water reorganizes around the complex. And so this is an example from Brian Olson's thesis who came from my lab, and this is the delta opioid receptor. And we have this network of five water molecules right here. The blacks are the hydrogen densities, the reds are the oxygen densities. And this water right here, C10, is very unfavorable thermodynamically. And so we would like to go ahead and displace that. But this water molecule is making, is part of this network of water molecules. And so if we do displace it, uh, it's not interacting with the protein surface. It's not hydrogen bonding with the protein surface. But if we do displace it, we want to do it in such a way that we don't disrupt the water network. And you go ahead and this ligand comes in. And what does it do? It sticks a hydroxy group right here. And it does so in such a way that we don't disrupt this water network. This water molecule still has something to bind with. This water molecule still binds with that, this hydroxy group. And if you just looked at this local water molecule, you'd say, oh, well, it's not interacting with the protein surface. Let's put something that's complementary there. We, we kick this water out. It's unfavorable. We should get a contribution to the free energy. That would be wrong, and that would be a failing of the initial ideas of how to apply solvation mapping, because the reorganization of this network would be unfavorable, because we would basically be taking out away a hydrogen bond from this water here in this water here. And this has been used. Yeah. Sorry, we have a question from the audience. So mm -hmm. for cases where you have continuous regions of hydration outside of the spheres from water map, what are the time scales required for water to sample all possible com configurations, microstats in the binding pocket? Is there a way to quantify convergence? Is it common that waters get stuck in a particular configuration yeah. from time scale of molecular dynamics? Yeah, so, so one of the nice things about water, if you're looking at it, sort of a rigid protein, is that the time, the length, the the time scale of a hydrogen bond relaxing in bulk water is a few picoseconds, and so you can. So if you're in a region where water caves like bulk like, the the water relaxes very quickly, right? One of the problems, and I'll get to it in a minute, is that sometimes you have occluded water molecules. Like uh, let's go over here. This occludes a water molecule right here. If you don't have this in the beginning then you might never act, actually sample it in a molecular dynamic simulation. This is something that's that's being actively pursued is how do we actually sample the water molecules in this region? In most circumstances, we can get away with running simulations that are relatively short. I know that Schrodinger early on for water map was using two, two, two nanoseconds of simulation. That might be a little short, but you can go ahead and, and get 10 nanoseconds. And what you really want is if you have a fundamental relaxation time of your fluid, which is for water in bulk is just a few, is just a few picoseconds, then you want many multiples of that. And so you can get that. Now on surfaces of proteins, depending on the surface, depending on how occluded the water molecules are, you can actually have much slower relaxation. Those are generally pretty easy to identify. Waters that are occluded from going into the bulk, um, and, and there are some methods that you can go ahead to, you never actually know fully in any 
molecular dynamic simulation, whether or not you've equilibrated and sampled well, but there are tests that you can go ahead and do starting from different conformations, make sure that you end up with the same distribution to check them, to check whether or not you properly sampled. All right. So, um, this is this is this is you know sort of retrospective, but now there's been a, a lot of prospective stuff in fact, Sose Heptares. This is Pierre Matricone's work, and Sose Heptares has really, I think, taken a lead or one of the leads in using water in prospective drug discovery. And here they have this network right here, and they have an unfavorable water right here. But this water molecule is actually interacting with the ligand itself and interacting with the water network, and Really, what they did here was they go ahead and and they replace this. They say, "Look, this water is unfavorable. We want to replace it, but we have to do so in such a way that that the that we don't disrupt the good interactions that this water molecule is having having with its environment." And so they put a hydroxy group here again and donate a hydrogen bond here, or donate a hydrogen bond to this carbonyl on on the ligand itself, and and they show it right here and also with the water network over here. And so this is pro, this is you know, things that have been done prospectively. There's some, so th there's some things that you also don't want to do for the end state is you don't want to occlude water, all right? So we have lots of water mediated interactions. Here we have four, you know, this water can make four hydrogen bonds. So this is actually okay. And this is a nice paper with some nice graphics from the Marcus Lill group. Um, but when can you occlude water? You can occlude water when you have basically water molecules that 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 can make their full complement of hydrogen bonds, either with the protein and the ligand or with the or the protein ligand and surrounding water molecules. All right. What you don't want to do is occlude water molecules in regions where they don't make their full complement of hydrogen bonds. And so this is another example of where you can't sort of look at the initial state of hydration, displace unfavorable water without considering the fact that you may disrupt these networks. Gerhard Klebe had some prospective work on designing compounds that stabilize the water networks and got a 50-fold increase in this, in this work over here. And this is another thing that also from Sose Heptares, where they've used prospective work. So that initial idea for water map is you go ahead, you remove the how you, you remove the ligand, you find the unhappy regions of water, and then you want to displace those water molecules. But they also not only displace these, but they also interacted with water molecules that were originally unfavorable, but they did it in such a way so that, so that such that they stabilized them and made them. Uh, more stable. Here's another example prospectively. One more thing that I want to go ahead and show you is that is that water actually, if you look where water goes on the surface of a protein, you can map it out. And that gives you a spatial mapping of where you can actually grow your ligands. And then you can go ahead and color them by different colors. Here I've colored energetically unfavorable in white. This is factor 10A once again. But if you can go ahead and identify regions where the water is unfavorable, where the water can go, you know where the ligand can go. If the water can go there, the ligand can go there. And you can identify the thermodynamics and you can use that to go ahead and, and help you help you make your rational modification uh, uh, decisions. And not only that, if you look at how the water molecules interact with the protein surface, it can also tell you what type of group to put there. Yeah. So one of the things I'm I'm working on and I'm very excited about right now is so we have this image of what the ligand needs to look like from the water. And this is very advantageous because we actually don't need any chemical matter to map out the types of interactions that we have with the protein surface. So there's two, this is, this is a, a very early slide of mine, but it basically says, well, you know, what do you need to design a, mo a molecule or a drug? You have to have shape complementarity, that's your puzzle pieces. And then you need charge complementarity, minuses next to pluses acceptors next to donors or hydrophobics or hydrophobic groups next to hydrophobic groups and the two things will fit together. So complementarity is the shapes fit and the charges match, but we get both of those with water. So water is, is somewhat ideal for, for mapping out interactions. You don't need chemical matter. If the, if the, it, 
fits to the shape of the cavity because that's what fluids do. And so it gives you the shape of the cavity, but it also gives you the types of interactions that you want. Water will donate hydrogen bonds where the protein has an acceptor. It'll accept hydrogen bonds where the protein has a donor, and it'll do neither in both place in, in where it, neither is necessary, where the where the protein surface is neutral. So early on, I guess this is five years ago, we spent many years trying to get this patented unsuccessfully, um, but this was quite old. So anyways, we mapped this out and blue would be donors and red would be acceptors. This would be a water derived pharmacophore. This would be a ligand based pharmacophore once again with streptavidin. And you can see that you have similar interactions. And then we could use that as a pharmacophore search to find other compounds retrospectively, it did quite well. So this is, this is sort of the modern software. So we map out high density regions of the surface. So this is, I have a company called Deep Waters and we we're develop software to map out properties of water on surfaces. Uh, we get high density regions. We color regions blue by donors, red by acceptors. And then we can identify regions where water is with high density, color them blue with as donors, red as acceptors and purple would be either donor acceptor or both donor and acceptor. Get some of those over here and we get this map of the pro of a protein surface. So it's an interaction site map. For each of these regions, we can also go ahead and calculate the thermodynamics and local structural features to, to know whether or not we should prioritize them. Here's the ligand that binds here. Here's our, our, our water-derived pharmacophore map. And you can see the water molecules make the, con make the same similar contacts. And so the idea is, can we use this for prospective drug discovery? Can we identify compounds uh, by, by, doing, by making, making these maps? Okay, and so we've effectively done that. And, and um, here's, you know, here's some preliminary tests from Yunjiji and, and VJ Molino in, in my group. Uh, and we go ahead and we look at, so here over here, we have a, cog, this is retrospectively, we have a cognate crystal pose. We have the interact, we have overlaid with our water-based pharmacophores. We have an alignment using several different methods of aligning the ligands to the protein. And then we have an overlap and then sometimes, a lot of times we're getting it right and we're getting very good ag agreement and alignments and sometimes we're getting it wrong. This one actually had to do with the fact that this was an acceptor and we had, and we had assigned it as a donor because the water predominantly donated there, but it actually did both. And so this was a misassignment of ours that we should have included this as a donor or an acceptor. Uh, that's actually, you know, is it a feature or a bug? In a sense, it's a feature because if you only have this chemical matter, you think it's an acceptor, but the water actually gives both donors and acceptors here. So if we can find the right way of assigning that, then we can actually find chemical matter that could either donate or accept right there. Both would be appropriate. We also can map out the shapes of the different cavities. And so a shape and charge complementary, this is just a set of ligands. It shows you that the, that the water shape that it gives you fits in with all the ligands that are known to bind to it. And this pharmacophore idea has been used uh, prospectively uh, in this paper right here, and I'm forgetting which group did this. It's the Heitmeyer group, but I can't remember where the association is. All right, so the last challenge is, well, what about protein motion? So a lot of, so, you know, many companies right now are really Excuse interested. Me, yeah. Do you mind if I ask a question? So before go I ahead. go into dynamics, so yeah. I'm wondering if your mapping and deep water tool is capable of properly using alpha fold or computation predicted protein structures as well, because we know there are different confidences in local structures predicted by those models. Right. And that is a challenge to deal with those structures. Yeah. So one, so one of the challenges, I mean, we, we can use it. I've never used it prospectively. We can definitely use it, get a mapping of it. Um, one of the, there's a couple problems. One is that the thermodynamics and structure of water is pretty sensitive to fluctuations in the cavity size. And so I, you know, I would imagine that when you use alpha fold and I haven't, I haven't used it and tested it, that you might get some, some fuzziness as to exactly where the atoms are and you wouldn't get a very good characterization of what the cavity was. And that can, that can change the water structure and thermodynamics in, in, in these tightly enclosed cavities. Um, 
in the end, you know, how would you go ahead and do that? Well, go ahead and see if you can get retrospective retrospect first, you know, like, like we all do is you go, go ahead, you give it the straw man case. If it doesn't work for this, you know, then we know it's not going to work for anything. That's always my first straw man. And then if it works for that, then you go ahead and deal with more complex cases, but I would do a, a, a mapping and then a retrospective test sort of like we initially did for the pharmacophores in on, on with known crystal structures. Okay. okay? Thanks. So, you know, now everyone's going, well, what about protein motion? And, and this is a nice paper from Anna Kamenik and out of the Shoikit group and Marcus Fisher, uh, who now has his own lab at St. Jude. Uh, but, and I just love the way that they map out the surfaces here. But so th this is their cytochrome C peroxidase. It's a, it's a, a, a model binding system, but they have three different shapes of the cavities that each accommodate different chemical matter. And so often when we look at a protein structure, we're looking at one, let's say the purple right here, and that's going to accommodate certain matter, but it, it may not, it, but that purple is not going to accommodate this thing that binds over to here to this, to this green shape. Okay. So we want to sort of be able to sample and look at different conformations of the protein, and they're going to accommodate different chemical matter. That's also very useful if you want to get away from the IP of in chemical space of identifying compounds that bind to a different structure. And this, for the SARS-CoV-2, we actually identified a number of different clusters. This is, this is a known ligand that binds to, to one of them. I think, I can't remember the name of the ligand right now, but you can look and see, you know, one of the conformations has this whole loop close off this S2 pocket here, and you'd have very different chemical matter that would be complementary to the surface here. So if we can go ahead and do that, then we can, and go ahead and map out the hydration of each of these different structures and use this as a, as, as a way of, of prospectively finding uh, compounds. So why is, water, why is a water-based approach ideally suited for dealing with protein structural fluctuations? Well, it has to do with you know, the general definition of a fluid. It's the particles easily move and change the relative position. The water fills up the cavity. That's what a fluid does. You have a different shaped cup, it fills up the different shaped cup. You have a different shaped protein cavity, it fills up the different shaped protein cavity, and it does it in a way that it's still complementary to the surface. So for every single structure that we generate here, if we were to look at the water on this, the water is not only going to give us the shape, but it's also going to give us the electrostatic complementarity. Right? Here's just a movie. Here's, here's a glutamine that's flipping around. You go ahead, the glutamine flips around and the water interaction with it changes. And so this is the donor acceptor thing that I alluded to earlier. So the water changes, changes size. This is, this is, this is a, a movie that we did a long time ago, but it, it was, it, this is MDM2. It's a protein-protein interface. But if you just look at the chemical structure, you get this and you think, wow, I can't modify my compound or grow anything in this region over here. You run the simulation, this whole area moves up so that if you go ahead and do this, identify the different conformations and then look at the water, the water is going to go ahead and give you this. But one of the problems is how do we automate identifying two structures that are different from each other? This is closed sometimes, this ends up opening up, but which ones would you consider open here and which ones would you consider closed here? And you can't really target every single confirmation that you generate because you might generate a million different confirmations. So I think a, a, a significant challenge in drug discovery right now is going ahead and saying, okay, we need a subset of confirmations that we can actually target. We can't target a million, but can we reduce this to a certain number like we did in right here where we have, I can't remember 10, I think it was 10 or 12 different confirmations of SARS-CoV-2 that we viewed as being significantly different from each other. Okay, and in the last thing is you go ahead and you map out the surface of the protein. And one of the questions, this was a, a project that started with Silicon Therapeutics, they got sold and became Royvant and then Royvant disbanded and became Cyvant. And I don't even know what's going on. I don't know who I'm gonna be working with next on this, but. Uh, this is this ended up being, can we look at the solvation mapping and identify using machine learning? This is my one touch on machine learning here, Ali, is using machine learning, can we go ahead, look at the solvation thermodynamic mapping 
and you identifying pockets and say, is this a binding site or not? And retrospectively test that. And we actually did quite well on that, um, but it's still unpublished. And this is the last two slides I'm gonna go ahead. I've been uh, the scientific advisor for a company called Ventus Therapeutics and uh, helping implement what's called the Resolve platform. And so there's this effective uh, tool that starts with the protein structure and then you go ahead and you run unrestrained molecular dynamics. You need a good way of, of sampling these alternate conformations and you generate different protein states and you need a metric. They, theirs is proprietary, it's called order rank clustering, which identifies which ones of these are significantly different from, e from each other. Then you map them out, you map out the water properties on each one of these and you get different, they call them hydrocophores, what I've been calling water derived pharmacophores and the, the, the mapping method is, is, is somewhat different, but it, it identifies H bond donors, H bond acceptors and lipophilic or hydrophobic sort of groups. You go ahead, you have these patterns and you can, and you can also get the shape complementarity. They, they map out the dipole field to know where you should put polarized compounds. Um, and, uh, and you can go ahead and create pharmacophores or hy hydrocophores of different um, in, in different pockets, and while looking at alternate conformations of proteins. And one of the things that's great about this, you know, I got some clarification yesterday. You know, so I've been involved in helping them with the with the solvation parts of this. This is a protein protein interface. Uh, you. They identified an alternate conformation of it that had a pocket that opened up and then used the hydrocophore to go ahead and, I, and map out how a potential ligand, so they used the water to map out how a potential ligand would interact with it. And they found a, 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 a number of different chemical compounds, so distinct chemical scaffolds that bind with low uh, micromolar uh, contribution to this interface. Um, this is an allosteric kinase pocket. And what's really uh, impressive to me of all of these is that each one of these pockets is something that does not exist in a crystal structure. Each one was generated by sampling, alternate conformations, clustering, identifying which ones are significantly different, solvating the cavities, and then doing pattern matching of three and a half billion compounds originally, 17 116 hits to the solvation mapping, then refinement using molecular dynamics on these and buying 48 compounds. And they found 11, 11 validated selective binders that are chemically distinct from each other. That's an allosteric kinase pocket that does not show up in the crystal structure. And this other undruggable target right here, once again, screened through 3.5 billion compounds 1,570 preliminary hits, 34 compounds actually purchased in seven, seven that were then experimentally validated as, as being binders. Okay. Just to put one last caveat on this before I finish up, if you look at all the terms, free energy, all the terms that contribute to the free energy of binding, you know, I, I'm selling the water, I'm talking about the water and its importance, and because that's my field, but you have the energy of the ligand, the internal strain of the ligand. You have the entropy of the ligand or the loss of entropy of the ligand when it binds. You have the, the strain on the protein. You have the change in the entropy of the protein when you, when you bind over here. You have the ligand protein interactions that are generally optimized and lead optimization. And you have a, a loss of entropy from forming the, con from forming the complex all of these terms are important as well as the terms that are modeled by solvation, which are how is the lig what's the what's the free energy of the of the ligand solvation? How does the protein water energy change? How does the water entropy change? And how does the water water interactions change? So four of these terms are categorized by solvation. All of these terms are important. And just to go ahead and and thank the different people. This is my group right now, Musa, Yunji, Vijay, Joe, Joe, and Abdar, uh, Dan McKay at Ventus Therapeutics. Um, I should really have put the entire team there now, um, and former group members of my group.
funding from from the I'm really grateful I've gotten a mirror grant recently, which really makes a world of difference. And this is my group right here. And I'm glad to take any questions you may have. Thanks a lot, Tom. It was a fantastic presentation. So I think Julio and my colleague has a question. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That was great. And uh, it's clearly had a big impact, as you've demonstrated by all the validated drugs and, and hits that are being identified. So that's really impressive. Um, so rather than trying to predict binding affinity, do you think it's possible to use your tool to predict for selectivity between highly conserved pockets? Um, I'm asking because there's a lot of redundancy in endogenous ligands, so nucleotides binding to kinases or G proteins. And you mentioned SOCI, and I know they focus on GPCRs. So I wonder if you've seen that the water mapping is better for those um, those types of enzymes. And I guess, in effect, I'm asking like if you've seen that water molecules are responsible for selectivity between the pockets which bind the same endogenous ligand, because, you know, as you know, it's hard to get selectivity between these conserved pockets oftentimes. And, you know, endogenously, ATP is there, but it's not necessarily binding to all of the kinases or all of the, the G proteins. Um, so could could water molecules or could your tool be used to help with designing more selective drugs or at least drugs that bind to a, a desired panel of proteins? Right. So so um, so that's an idea that's been floating around for, for quite a while. There's an early paper that that Schrodinger applied water map to and said, OK, we can explain uh, selectivity. I think it was in the SARC kinases um, between different compounds, different cavities that look almost identical to each other, but the thermodynamics of the mapping of the water is different. So if you can go ahead and have two, uh, two proteins that have very similar cavities that map out the, that look on paper or look to our eye to be exactly the same, you map out the solvation thermodynamics and you can find differences in the thermodynamics, you may be able to get some selectivity between the two. I am not aware of, and that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, of anything that's actually been perspective using that idea. You know, the other, the other idea is if you can get fluctuations that occur in one protein, so structural fluctuations that occur in one protein that you're not seeing in other proteins, you may be able to design chemical matter that occurs in alternate shapes of the, of the cavities. Oh, and, I see. And, and, okay. and I believe that has, I believe that there are, you know, behind the IP curtain examples of that being done. Yeah, I guess that would make at, sense. At, if at it's more flexible. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Thank you for that. Great. So I wanted to thank you again, Tom, for the great presentation as part of Cyclic Osmolecular to Medicine series. So do you have any other last thought or comment? No, I mean, I it's... I, I gave a talk recently. I, I'm I'm pretty excited about it. Is is um, it, it, which is which is you know I've always been I have always loved water and 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 thermodynamics, but I'm excited about it because I think that the field, so say Heptaris and Ventus, has finally evolved to the point where it's really can be used, and, and our understanding of how to use it has evolved to the point where it can be really used effectively in real prospective drug discovery um, applications in industry. And so, uh, and the other thing is, you know, you come up with a methodology and then it takes so long, you know, rogaratinib was 10, 10 years, you know, so you're sort of claiming it's useful <laughs> for 10 years and then you finally have a little bit of validation. Now there's enough prospective validation that really says, wow, this, this, this actually has had a real impact and and from what I understand is is there's significantly more impact in projects where they actually got what they wanted from the water, which is affinity, um, which which is affinity and rational optimization. But the projects were were dropped because they ended up not being drugs and then never published on. So uh, it, it, it there's a lot of successes out there at this point. And and um, when I talk to you. Know, people who actually design drugs, I'm, I'm a salvation person, I, and, and have used these methods, I generally get something, hey, we've actually used it prospectively. So it's really exciting, yeah. Awesome, it is indeed, for sure. So yeah, thank you all for joining us for this uh, Cyclical Molecular to Medicine session. And thanks again, Tom, for the great presentation. The, 
presentation will be available on YouTube shortly. But if you have any question, you can also reach out to us at Cyclica and also Tom directly. Yeah. Have a I, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't mind staying on. I can answer. I saw a couple of questions. If, I don't know if you so, need to leave, but uh, anything. Well, I, I would not use nucleic acid targets. There, there's too charged, and I wouldn't. I mean, oh, they're, something they're, just got they're too yeah. They're too difficult. <laughs> That's that's my answer there. And there's too many ions on the surface. So, yeah. There's also another question, Tom, about why experimental studies X-ray sometimes fall, fall to locate water molecules in certain proteins. Um, fail, actually. Yeah, sorry. I don't know yeah. if fail is the right word. I mean, there's there's when I first developed the method to tie, you know, to sort of cluster where the water molecules are, I wanted to go ahead and say, okay, well, how how good a job are we doing at identifying where these water molecules are in simulation um, compared to the X-ray data? And I started looking at the PDB, and I'm trained as a theorist, and so I had, actually I had to look at the experimentalists' work, and and I found out that reporting water molecules in by X-ray crystallographers is not something that has a standard practice. Some people left them in. So now, nowadays, current practice is people actually put them in. But back then, like people wouldn't put them in. How do you actually identify what the criteria for identifying these a position is? Um, Greg Warren, who was at OpenEye at the time, has a fantastic paper of really comparing what you get from molecular dynamic simulations and comparing it from crystal structures. And the agreement is outstanding. And, and the agreement for where water molecules are in simulation really comes from the fact that it's really easy to get water structure in a model. Um, there, there's just two things you need to get right, which is the right size of the water molecules and the fact that it has directed hydrogen bonds. You don't even need to get the strength of those hydrogen bonds correctly to get the, to get the water structure because it's effectively many times thermal energy uh, so a hydrogen bond's much stronger than thermal energy. It packs in there. What you have to be concerned about is sampling in molecular dynamic simulations. And so in most circumstances where that's not an issue, you, you sample it uh, well. Yeah, cool. We actually have more questions, Tom. So can several PDB structures and at different conformations be useful in water mapping? For example, possible with NMR base or cryo and ensembles. Yeah. yeah, so it's funny with the NMR, you know, there was a battle between the NMR and the crystallographers, whatever, at least I've in, in the lore that I hear is that, you know, the crystal, the the NMR always had an ensemble of different structures and the crystallographers sort of won the battle because they're like, this is the structure, there's just one. Now the entire field has moved over to, hey, we actually want to look at all the different structures. So you want to look, and because they're probably all bindable by compounds, they are bindable by different chemical matter. So we want to use everything. So there's room temperature crystallography that can give you alternate conformations. There's uh, cryo-EM that can give you alternate conformations. There's NMR that gives you alternate conformations. And, and I think a major effort, or I know a major effort right now is being spent on how do you actually computationally sample different structures and reliably, meaning are our models good enough when we move away from the crystal structure that we get, are our models actually predictive of enough such that we generate confirmations that are reflect reality of, of different confirmations exactly that actually exist in your body. Um, uh, that's one thing that is with which I'm excited about my work with Ventus is they've actually generated alternate confirmations using computational models and found drugs that bind to those alternate confirmations. So that's that's a very sort of I don't know of prospective work outside of Ventus that's done that. I don't know if it exists. Yeah. Great. Very exciting. Yeah. I don't see any other question. If there is no other question, maybe we can wait for a couple of seconds if anybody else has any question. So. Okay. Any last thought, Tom? No, I'm good. Okay. Thanks, thanks perfect. For... So. 
Thank you. It was fantastic. I learned a lot. So I'm on the other side of the realm, more into the machine learning side of yeah. drug discovery. But I learned a lot from you and it was a very, very interesting and insightful presentation for sure. So if there is no other question or and no other thought from Tom, I hope you all have a great day. Excellent. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Tom. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom. Bye. 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 Bye.